Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources, and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. Hello, this is Craig McConnell with Ransomed Heart, and this is our podcast. I want to welcome you. Good to have you listening in. And actually, this is the fourth part of a four-part interview that we did with Michael Cusick. Uh, John Eldridge and I sat down for about an hour, and Michael did a great interview. We just enjoyed it so much, we thought we would uh, divide it up and offer it as four podcasts. This last one is on God speaking in healing. If you make an agreement that God doesn't speak to you, guess what your experience is going to be? You're not going to hear God. Exactly. God doesn't speak to me. You know? So you've got to be really, really careful you know, not to give place to these things in your heart and in your life. And again, they're usually connected to, to wounds, disappointments. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I was actually going to ask you about that in the spiritual direction and soul care that I do. I, I encounter so many people that they don't hear God. Mm-hmm. They don't believe that God speaks, mm-hmm. specifically that God doesn't speak to them. Mm-hmm. How do you respond to that, and how do you walk with people on that journey? Well, let's start with John chapter 10. Four times in John chapter 10 alone, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. Um, My sheep hear my voice. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Uh, They too will hear my voice and follow me. And then take Revelation where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice. Again, that's a letter written to the church, by the way. It's written to Christians. that We use it in evangelism, and I think that's fine, but it's actually a letter written to Christians. And he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and be intimate with him, sup with him and he with me. Okay, so you have to start with it's biblical, it's normal, <laughs> it's available, because if you're not convinced of that, you're going to have a hard time getting past this. Um, it is... It is not uncommon, however, to meet people who don't experience hearing the voice of God. So while it's scripturally normative, it's not normal Mm. in the Christian life, sadly, to say. And it wasn't for me. Nobody told me that this was available. Um, I came to Christ through a pretty stunning conversion at age 19, and I went to a great Bible teaching church, and they taught me to love the scriptures and how to study, and and I'm very, very grateful for that. But nobody taught me this, that God speaks intimately and speaks personally. Um, But as you begin to unpack the scriptures and you realize, oh my goodness, all these stories of God speaking to his people, he doesn't give you those stories and then tell you, but you can't have that, Hmm. you know. Um, So I think um, you want to begin by recognizing it's biblical, it's appropriate, it's available. And then step two is, so what's in the way? What's in the way? Um, Because it it varies on what's in the way. Your heart, Ephesians chapter 3, your heart is where Christ dwells. The Father would strengthen us through his spirit and our inmost being that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Your heart is now where Christ dwells. And so if you have shut down the heart, (laughs) if you have dismissed the heart, uh, if you spurn your heart, if you reject it, if you have buried it, if it is under a rubble of pain, disappointment, and a boatload of agreements, it's going to be very difficult. So step two, what's in the way? Is it a shut down heart? Is the enemy here? You know, what are the, what are the reasons that I'm having a hard time hearing the voice of God? Um, and, and then just beginning to pray, you know, Lord, open my ears. Open my ears to hear your voice. Let me recognize the many ways that you're speaking to me every nice. day, which is through Scripture, uh, you know, uh, through the counsel of others, and, and then uh, through your still, quiet voice within us. Yeah. Through creation, everything. You know, a lot of what lies behind this, Michael, is your image of God. Mm-hmm. I mean, is, do we view God as a good father who wants to make himself known, who wants mm-hmm. to speak mm-hmm. and be engaged? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Scripture convinces us that God knows us intimately, but we're unconvinced he wants to know that we can know him intimately. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is the image of God behind a view that doesn't hold that he speaks, that he makes himself known, that he wants to be a part of our every moment and every day in some personal, real, unique, and intimate way? I mean, so it's not a good picture of God, not, in my mind, not a biblical picture of God, that he's silent. And you're making a distinction, I think, between what we believe cognitively and yes. that truth of the inmost being 
Yeah, that yeah. which lies deep beneath oh. all our religious oh. confessions and creeds. That's Tozier. Yeah. And, and yeah. Tozier, right, that he says what you actually believe about God is buried beneath your creedal statements and often takes a good deal of unearthing to discover, mm. right? But what you believe about God, this is a good place to test that. Does he want to speak to you? Again, if you just start there with, why would God want to speak to me? You're going to have a difficult time hearing from him, mm. you know? But if you're adored, if you're loved, if you're a son, a daughter, Jesus calls you his friend. Mm. If you are a friend of God, then of course he'd want to speak to you. Mm. So segueing into the fourth stream of healing, that's getting down into that inmost place where Jesus yes. comes. Can you talk about the stream of healing, either one of you? I like to think of it as sanctifying the past. Hmm. I think everyone can relate to the desire to have Jesus be present with us. Lord, come into all I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Fill my. If I'm a student, fill my studies. You know, if I'm married, fill my marriage. I mean, mm-hmm. we want Jesus to be a part of our lives now. Well, a lot of us have places in our past where Jesus was not invited in or was mm-hmm. not part of the story. Or you know, So I like to think of it as sanctifying the past, that there are memories, there are wounds, there are experiences, there are things that were said to us, things that were done, um, things that we did that very much need now the presence of Christ in them to cleanse, to heal, to restore, to sanctify, to make whole. For example, sexuality. You know, human sexuality is is an absolutely beautiful and deeply mysterious part of our soul. But as you know, Michael, if someone's wounded in their sexuality through sexual sin, uh, trauma, experience, abuse, they're wounded about as deeply as a person can get wounded because it's so close to who we are as men and women. Well, that requires the healing presence of Jesus Mm -hmm. to come back into those. So you take early sexual experiences, for example. Confession and repentance are a part of that and a deep part of that. Forgive me. I renounce that. I renounce my part in that. But it's not enough. It's not Mm -hmm. sufficient. This is that, you know, Jesus knocking at the door. Will you let me into this place in your life? And what we have found is that Christ is very eager to come back into memories, experiences, um, childhood wounds, you know, and to heal the damage that was done to the soul there and also to free the soul from the opportunities that that gave to the evil one. Because, you know, again, using sexuality as an example, if you have early experiences as a young man with pornography, that that awakens things in your soul that touches things down there so deeply Mm. that the enemy just has a field day with that and it gets a stronghold in there. And then you find yourself at, you know, 49 wrestling with lust or affairs or homosexuality or whatever it may be. And to invite Christ back into the roots of these things, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to try and live a holy life now. That's important. And to make choices now. God honors those choices. But at the same time, I need to invite Christ back with me into my past. Lord Jesus, come into that first sexual experience. Come into that early introduction of pornography. Come into that cleanse my soul there. Make me holy there. Come into these memories. And there's obviously a great deal more that needs to be described in this. But what we are simply describing is inviting the presence of Jesus into those memories those events, those wounds, and then following his lead there. Sometimes it requires breaking of deep agreements, right? I am a lustful person. Well, if you make an agreement that you're a lustful person, you're probably yeah. going to find yourself struggling with lust for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, and again, that's tied to the good heart, bad heart thing, right? right. If, you think your heart, if you think your heart's bad. Um, I was just in... Uh, Santa Barbara, California, and then it's a very, very sexual city, largely because of University of California there, um, you know, gorgeous women, scantily clad everywhere. And the spirit of seduction just swirls around the place. There's just a sexual enticement and excitement and licentiousness and sin, that kind of thing. Okay. Well, I mean, the whole weekend I am just navigating, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want, I'm getting hit with the temptation. But if you think your heart is evil, if you think you actually do want that, you're toast. Yeah. You're history. You know, but just to recognize, no, 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 no. I don't desire. You know, you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Mm. Paul says, I don't want that. The, the freedom that that brings mm. 
to go, no, no, mm-hmm. I, no, I want God. I want a genuine holiness. I, um, but that, for me, that only is because I've gone back through my sexual history and both renounced sins but also invited the healing ministry mm-hmm. of Christ, mm-hmm. you know, and breaking agreements with um, sexual brokenness and all of that, you know, that, that deep, deep stream of inner healing is extraordinarily important for individuals to be able to live the life they want to live with God now. Hmm. You mentioned holiness, and I want to end on this note. You have a, a teaching that is strangely named, The Utter Relief of Holiness. Talk about holiness and um, what the Bible has to say about that versus what we often think holiness is. Oh, the, uh, pff, where do you begin? <laughs> Part two. Yeah. <laughs> First off, that holiness is a matter of the heart in Scripture. Clearly it is. Um, Jesus says you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're a disaster. Motives, issues of idolatry, right? I'm setting up other gods in your heart, you know, all of that. Their words are like butter, but their hearts are drawn swords. You know, with their mouths they're blessed, but with their hearts they curse. So it's a matter of the heart. Holiness is a matter of the heart. And the beauty, the absolute and phenomenal promise of the scriptures is that you get the holiness of Jesus, not just positionally. Yeah. And this is where, I mean, Craig, wouldn't you say that most teaching is positional? Yeah, legal. In the heavens. Our position. Yeah. Future realization. Yeah. Yes, right. Your it's name. It's not substantive. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that the holiness of Christ is imparted to you so that when you get to the gates in heaven, Though your sin's record is real, it's blotted out by the merit of Jesus Christ. So, And that's true, by yes. the way. That's all true, and yes. that's all really, really good news. But there's more. Why would, God, why would God forgive you and then leave you in the same condition that required Jesus to be sent to the cross hmm. and leave you in the same condition to repeat for the rest of your life those sins that drove you to your knees in repentance – Uh, The first time, right? It's cruelty beyond imagination to pardon someone and then commit them to repeating for the rest of their life the very sins for which Christ had to atone and for which now they grieve and and lament deeply, right? With ever building guilt, shame, and self-loathing. No, resignation and finally just checking out. The, The utter relief of holiness is that a genuine internal holiness is available to us so that you can not only desire to live the kind of life that Jesus lived, you can actually live like him. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, right? But we all, with unveiled faces, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. That's what the gospel is supposed to do to an individual. Again, you'll know them by their fruits. The gospel is supposed to transform people into the image of Jesus with ever-increasing glory. And the way that that comes to us is through the impartation of the life of Christ in us. He literally becomes our life so that the holiness is authentic. It's not legalistic so that it is internal and not merely you know, functional and external so that it touches realms of motive and realms of desire and realms of worship and all of that, realms of idolatry, so that there is a genuine transformation of the personality of the individual, Mm -hmm. not just Mm -hmm. their habits, Mm -hmm. their personality Mm -hmm. is transformed. And yes, it's an utter relief. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Right? Not to struggle with hatred anymore, Mm -hmm. not to hate people, not to struggle with jealousy or bitter envy or all those things that are listed in Scripture as as the fruits of the flesh. My goodness, what a relief that is. Holiness is is a word that is just, unfortunately, carries so many things with it. But in effect, what holiness is, is the life we've always wanted to live. And it's available. Yes, exactly. Again, in Romans 6, Paul says, Sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Imagine that. Holy cow, <laughs> sin shall not be master over you? Hmm. Right? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. I'm not consigned to repeat these things over and over again. Hallelujah. Hmm. If people knew, right, that if this was the gospel that was taught and explained and offered, 
I mean, we'd be a whole lot farther down the road on evangelizing hmm. than we are right now. Amen. Amen. Craig, if you had an opportunity to speak to pastors and Christian leaders with your background of losing heart and then finding your heart again through a deep understanding of the gospel, what would you want to say to them? Oh, I'd want to say more important than your service, your sacrifice, your labor to God is your heart. And the the longing Mm. of God is Mm. for you to know him and enjoy him and to find a life in him that you may have once had or that you read of in scripture and yearn for, it's available. I mean, more important than anything you accomplish or do is just an intimate relationship with Christ. It's available. And out of that flows everything you'd love to do. Hmm. Craig McConnell and John Eldridge, thank you very much for your time today and your wisdom and heart. Bless you. You Great to be with you, Michael. Hope you enjoyed the fourth and final segment of this interview John Eldridge and I did with Michael Kusick. And you can find out a whole lot more about Michael and Restoring the Soul Ministries by going to RestoringTheSoul.com. And we invite you to go to RansomHeart.com. We'll uh, give you all the information you need about us, where we're going, what we're doing, what we offer. Thanks for listening. 